Hello and welcome to the Indie Beginning Podcast. It is our mission to bring indie authors and readers together through reviews, dialogue, and unique topic segments. This week, we bring you a discussion with indie author J.G. Follinsby about using climate change as a backdrop for his dystopian tale, Carbon Run. If you missed our reading of Carbon Run, head over to acmbooks.com forward slash indie dash beginning to listen to episode 33 or any of our previous episodes. It can also be found on your preferred podcasting platform. So what did you think about our featured beginning this week, Marie? I was really excited about this book. It had me from like the first sentence. Yeah, I thought it was very catchy right off the bat. Um, just the the little blurb that, that he sent in, I was like, cool, I want to put this on the show. I didn't even have to read it. We did, but yeah. it was it was nice to um it's always nice when you when you're excited before you read a book. I mean, we're suckers. We 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 love them all, but yeah, I love books that are, they take a very popular genre and completely change it. And this one, I think the viewpoints and how it starts is completely different on dystopia novels. Yeah, like right in the beginning, it's it's set in a dystopian future. It has a climate change backdrop, but it's not in your face about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I love the bird aspect. I mean... I don't think I've ever brought this up, but I have an obsession with birds that's been passed down the berry gene pool. I I can't <laughs> get rid of it. I yes, love birds. So. Light obsession. <laughs> so so he got me with that too. But anyways, let's see what other people thought about this story. Jim said, I found this to be a smartly rip- written dystopian tale. The author does a great job of showing us a world where not only the condition of the planet has been greatly altered by climate change, but also our society and the legal system. Lots of interesting details, well-written dialogue, and a plot that moves along well. Nice job. John, this is an excellent dystopian novel, probing a much warmer world of the future. Like all good books, this well-realized technical achievements play merely a background role to the dramas of the central characters. Well-paced, exciting, just a very enjoyable read. NWO says, Way more than just a story about climate change. Long after you read this, you'll recall powerful images of characters and situations that we'll all be facing soon. Written with consistent elegance, I can see this being a basis for a phenomenal TV series. Netflix, are you listening? Yeah, Netflix, are you listening? (laughs) Karina, I received this book as a gift. This is a great read, and I recommend it to those who want a different take on the dystopian genre. So we thought, we, we liked the idea that it's a dystopian tale, but it's not based on like a nuclear war or a zombie fallout type situation. J.G. Follinsby was using a topic pertinent to today mm-hmm. yeah, as right. his backdrop. Yeah. So I was kind of, I kind of liked the idea of the chicken or the egg. So I asked Joe, what influenced him to use climate change for his dystopian novel? Did he want to write a dystopian novel and needed a topic? Or did he want to write about the problems with climate change? and wrote a dystopian novel. The story of Carbon Run and uh, my series, Tales from a Warming Planet, really started back in the early 2000s with uh, an effort by the uh, city of Seattle, um, where I live, by its government to uh, do something to make uh, the city even greener than it already is. Seattle has a deserved reputation as a green city Um, that cares about the environment, but sometimes it can go a little too far or uh, do things that uh, seem at least a a little silly, at least to me. Uh, And so um, in one case, the city government wanted to put a a law into place that would impose a fine on uh, people who compost yard waste and food waste Um, if they put that waste into the wrong bin. So, for example, if you had some apple scraps or orange scraps and you accidentally put it into your garbage bin, as opposed to the food bin or the recycle bin, you might get a fine. And that got me thinking about uh, how far a government might have to go if society didn't get its act together and fight environmental problems um, such as climate change. So 
that's what really started me on this path. Um, what might happen, taking it to the extreme, if a government or a society in general had to do something that everybody today thinks might be impossible, but a hundred years from now would have to be done. That's kind of what it seemed like to me when I read it. So I asked Joe Fonsby if he thought that his story was a warning about the environment and how the government can use such a catastrophe against his people. And also, if he felt that as authors and creators, is it our duty to discuss current issues through our craft? Actually, I would disagree with the premise of your question. Um, what I was trying to show is one scenario that might occur if we as a society in the early 21st century fail to get a grip on this unfolding disaster called climate change. This is going to strain all of our institutions to the limit. We've only just seen the first indications of that. Uh, all you have to do is look at what happened uh, with Hurricane Katrina many years ago, uh, well, not too many years ago, uh, and how government uh, failed to respond. Um, just to flip that on its back for a minute, uh, if we're not prepared for the coming uh, changes, the, the changes that are just starting now, uh, if we don't act to mitigate what's happening, um, society might feel so desperate that uh, we as voters might institute changes that could lead to a uh, situation uh, like I describe in Carbon Run with the uh, institution that I invented called the Bureau of Environmental Security. One only has to look at the history of Germany in the first part of the 20th century where um, the uh, voters literally voted in uh, the um, Nazi party in 1933. And we all know what happened in the 15 years after that. Uh, th those people were desperate at that time, those voters, uh, the people of Germany, um, and they hardly knew what they were probably getting themselves into, but we know what happened uh, and there's nothing really except our vigilance and our ability to act as a society together to prevent prime, uh, the climate change disaster um, that could uh, lead to um, something like that happening in our own country. Uh, it's, it's not hard to imagine. One simply has to take desperation to the extreme and we can come up with something by accident called the Bureau of Environmental Security. Um, do you feel that authors and creators uh, have a duty to discuss current issues to their crafts? Um, I don't know if they have a duty to do so, um, but I think it's inevitable if uh, a writer wants to be relevant somehow to a reader's um, world, um, whether it's the discussion of um, environmental disasters or changes um, to the planet's uh, climate or less you know dramatic or dangerous things such as um, love and marriage and children and our relationships to each other all those things um, are evolving and changing uh, and they're affecting people's lives today and a good narrative has to um, address those things that people experience for it to have any relevance to, to their lives. So I wouldn't say it's a duty to um, talk about these issues, but any writer that doesn't at least touch on these issues is probably failing their readers. I guess it was more of his way of showing what we as voters could do out of desperation to institute change. People often forget that the Nazis were voted in. Often people remember the tyrannical and hateful regime and falsely remember how they came to power. It wasn't a coup. It was people trying to do what they thought was best. I mean, in Joe's story, the people created the Bureau of Environmental Security out of a, 
a need to make things better. And then we see right in the first couple of chapters in the book, I mean, it's it's pretty devastating. Yeah. I also like that he said, not a duty, but any writer that doesn't at least dip into these issues is probably failing their readers. That's such a great way to look at it. With climate change being such a controversial and being a hot topic in the news, we asked Joe if there was anything in his story that he would like to change because of new information or if there has been any reader backlash on the subject matter. In short, the answer is no. Uh, there's really nothing that I would take out or, or change, uh, at least dramatically, because of new information. Um, as your readers uh, and listeners might have discovered, my very first chapter in Carbon Run starts with a forest fire. Uh, and um, I'm recording this in the early part of August um, 2018. And California is suffering possibly its worst forest fire season in history. Uh, and I don't take any pleasure in that. Uh, but it's not really difficult to imagine a world where a forest fire of that size, uh, the size that's happening in California, um, happens every year and it's going to get worse. Uh, this is the new normal. Uh, and the new normal is going to change. It's going to even gonna be even worse in the future. Not something I take pleasure in. But this is exactly what scientists uh, have been predicting for decades. And it's happening. Um, have I suffered any reader backlash? Well, fortunately, uh, my readers... Uh, have um, said very little uh, that I would consider to be criticism of the science or backlash about um, the um, activities and behavior of the characters. Um, of course, there's folks who quibble with one thing or another, but that's not really of a concern. I mean, uh, no narrative is perfect. It's a story. It's not meant to be a documentary. Um, and I focus on characters uh, and um, their uh, reactions to what's happening around them and their relationships to each other rather than the, the subject itself. Um, but um, uh, I personally would welcome any criticism of either the science I've chosen or the narrative. That's how writers uh, and all storytellers uh, improve their craft. Uh, so um, if... Uh, your listeners, uh, if uh, my readers have a problem, let me know. <laughs> I'd like to know about it. All right, Indeed Beginning fans, you heard him. The challenge is out there. We always add in the show somewhere to review the books you've read and the podcasts you've listened to or any art you enjoy or do not enjoy. Reviews help in a way that you may not even believe. But back to the interview. It's amazing to me how fate or the universe comes together at times. Foundsby wrote a story about climate change, starting with a forest fire, and then just that happens. Now, there's a forest fire every year, but this is one of the worst ones going on over there in California, or that was going on over in California while we recorded all this. You know, I looked it up. The car fire is like the sixth most destructive wildfire in California's history. And I'll leave a link to um, the article that has a full like the top 10 most devastating wildfires in history. Mm -hmm. And doing that tiny bit of research made us wonder what type of research went into a story on climate change. Well, like any uh, novel, um, particularly a science fiction novel, uh, but thrillers, romances, any kind of novel um, with a, on a specific subject, um, you have to do a lot of research. You have to do enough research so that you're familiar with the subject matter. Uh, and uh, climate change, of course, is a huge topic. Uh, the subject um, of uh, climate in general has been studied for uh, hundreds of years, but of course, most intensively in the last uh, thirty to forty years. Um, and of course, I'm not a I'm not a scientist per se, but um, I I needed to familiarize myself with at least the high level topic. Um, I found a great book called. Um, the Rough Guide to Climate Change, um, published by um, a Rough Guide series of books. Uh, the author is Robert Henson. 
and it gives a great high level view of all the issues involved uh, with uh, climate change, primarily from a scientific point of view, but also from a public policy point of view, uh, and also some of the um, uh, people who are uh, skeptical of climate change. Um, I consider these people to be um, in denial about reality. The science is incontroversial. Uh, there is a consensus. It, climate change is human caused. Uh, it is happening right now. Uh, and to deny that, I think, is just um, living in a fantasy land. Um, fortunately for me, uh, I'm a curious person. I, I read lots of articles all the time. I have two or three uh, uh, agents, uh, Google agents, you know, looking for news for me. So I s simply set up a, an agent looking for climate change stories, and I've been reading you know, several articles a week about the ongoing issue of climate change um, for really more than 10 years. So after a, a certain amount of time, you kind of absorb what is happening in, in the uh, science and in the politics uh, and in the culture uh, about climate change. So simply sticking with the subject, taking in as much as you can, uh, and then using that information to create a good narrative. Um, that's my process. And as always for our listeners, a bit of going back in time advice, because who doesn't like a time travel story? Wink, wink. She loves it when I write stuff for her to read. <laughs> well, before I started writing um, fiction, uh, at least intensively, I'd been writing uh, professionally for um, more than 20 years. I started out uh, in newspapers in um, the middle 1980s uh, and then uh, transitioned over to uh, radio for several years uh, and since then have written for magazines, I've done um, marketing material, public relations, things of that nature. Uh, so m my experience is fairly wide and somewhat deep, I guess. Um, so I kind of went into writing fiction with open eyes. I certainly suffered uh, plenty of rejections in many different kinds of um, contexts um, up to that point in the uh, early 2000s, mid, mid, mid aughts, you know, 2005-ish or so when I really started getting into fiction. Um, having said that, uh, I did learn uh, and have learned and continue to learn a lot about uh, what it means to be a fiction writer. Um, and if I could, uh, as the famous author um, did, uh, write a letter to my younger self, um, I would probably tell um, that younger Joe to uh, expect um, writing fiction to be a hard journey. There is nothing easy about uh, making up stories. Um, there won't be a lot of reward. And just write the best story you can and move forward, submit those stories, submit those manuscripts. Don't take rejection personally, uh, but remember that um, there are readers who want to read what you have to say. And uh, under the right circumstances, you'll succeed. He's absolutely right. It's not easy. It's a hard journey. Um, you just gotta write the best story you can. The, the main thing that everybody needs to realize is not to take rejection personally. And that's directly from what Joe said. That's directly from what we believe. I mean, Marie, how many rejection letters have you gotten? Over a hundred. Yeah, at least. I mean, you, you see, you hear about authors all the time. They have the shoebox thing. And if it wasn't for self-publishing and technology is the way it is today, I mean there probably wouldn't be like some of these great stories that we read. No, and I can't remember which author it was. I don't know. He write, He's one of our favorites. Um, oh, Ch Charlie Houston. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie Houston's great. Yeah. He actually went to a convention where they weighed rejection letters and he won second place. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it because number one, and everybody has to realize this, a lot of the rejection letters you get is a generic rejection letter. Now, on one hand of that, that seems 
rude and obnoxious that you you put all this work into this 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 story that, i mean it's your soul your life is in this story and somebody just sends back a computer generated response but on the other hand 10 million people are sending him a letter we we have been lucky that there's two of us to read all the submissions that have been sent to us but we're only reading the first couple of pages to see if it's even something that we can add to the show. And that's just part of the, the, the business that we're in. I mean, this isn't even a business to us. We're not even getting paid, right? but it's just, there's too many submissions. So to take it personally, when the person hasn't read it or has just sent you a rejection, it's just not for them. Just send it out to the next one. Mm -hmm. But speaking of indie beginning, there are people who want to read what you wrote. Marie and I are here. We love, I love reading the stories. She loves reading the stories out to the, the public. We love discussing the stories. So send us your, uh, your book if you want to be one of the featured artists. Yeah, our submission box has been filling up fast. We've been staying up late nights just going through. Uh, we haven't been getting to finalize the 2019 schedule, so there's still time for you to get your submission in. Yeah, people get bumped around all the time. It's like I said, it's part of the business. But 2019, I mean, we still have some openings. Nothing's been set in stone yet. So yeah, if you're an indie author or an indie publisher with an author under you, obviously, and would like to be a featured author on the Indie Beginning Podcast, go to acnbooks.com forward slash submit for more information. Send us in those uh, chapters and we'll get them out to the world. Well, that's our show for the day. You can find J.G. Follinsby's dystopian tale, Carbon Run, on Amazon. Remember to leave a review for the story after you have finished. As we heard in the episode, reviews are such an important part of any artist's career. Even a bit of constructive criticism can help an artist find the next path. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review as well. Are there any topics that you've been waiting for Indie Beginning to discuss with our featured authors? Send us an email at bfranke, that's B-F-R-A-N-K-E, dot acnbooks at gmail.com there'll be a link in the show notes these episodes are for you just as much as for the authors in the beginning would like to thank shirts by sarah for being such a wonderful sponsor of our program go to shirtsbysarah.com and find the shirt that tells your tale in the beginning is an acm books production all editing was done by myself i am benjamin frankie and i am marie cameron frankie asking everyone to read more books be the best possible you and to simply enjoy this wonderful life. Thanks for listening.